So we're going to start out uh, by looking at the last part of section um, 2.2, which is really on one thing. It's called uh, break-even point. Okay? So break-even point has to do with a company, and basically when they start making money. So it's when their revenue gets above their costs, and they start making profit. Okay, so we're going to basically look at a problem that involves that. Now, the example that I'm going to show you guys um, for this company, I think it's going to be a company that makes t-shirts. They're going to have two types of costs, fixed and variable. So fixed cost is a cost that never changes. Maybe it's like the rent the company pays for the building or the salaries for the employees. It doesn't matter how many t-shirts they make in a month, their rent isn't going to change. Right? Or the salary for employees is not going to change. Because they're not, you know, let's say employees are paid for the whole year. It doesn't matter how many shirts they make. So that's a fixed cost. A variable cost would be something that does change. Um, like let's say um, the amount of ink that the company uses, well that may change depending on how many shirts they print. Okay, so that, that's a variable cost. Uh, so this company has a fixed cost of $200,000. And a variable cost of $1.50 per shirt. Again, variable because how much does it cost to make all the shirts? It depends on how many they make. So the cost to make the shirts is $1.50. And they sell each shirt for $4. So $4 is what you call the revenue. It's not the profit. The revenue is just money that comes into the company. To figure out the profit, that's a little different. You'd have to take their costs and then subtract. Uh, you'd have to take the revenue and subtract the cost, and that's profit. I'm not really worried about profit in this problem. Just cost and revenue. Okay. So they want us to find graphs of these two equations. First, they want us to write an equation for the total cost and then write an equation for the revenue. Don't worry about profit. Okay, some people like start subtracting. Don't, we're not worried about profit. Okay, so let's start with the um, equation for the cost. How many um, different types of costs did we have in this problem? Is that? Two. Two. Okay. Fixed cost, variable cost. Now, fixed cost. How many times do you pay the fixed cost? Yeah? Once. Once. You pay that cost once. Maybe it's once per month, once per year, but you only pay it once. So let's start with that. So our cost. And we're going to need a variable, so I'm going to choose to use x, and we'll see in a minute what x represents. But the cost is a function of x. First of all, it's going to be 200,000. That's the fixed cost. Plus, how would I represent my variable cost if x is the number of shirts that I make? Number of shirts. Yep, 1.5x. So there's an equation for your costs. You tell me how many shirts you made, I'll plug it in for x, I'll tell you what the cost will be. Okay, and now revenue. What's going to be my formula for um, revenue? Just the money that comes into the company. Yep. 4x. 4x. Is it all profit? No. Some of it is going to have to pay the bills. But the money that comes into the company is 4x. Okay. Now they just want us to graph that. Questions on the two equations? All right. So let's graph it. Um, so we'll clear that. If you've got anything else typed in, you can just clear it out. 1.5x plus 200,000 and 4x. Okay, um, first question, is a standard window 
gonna work for that. No, way, way, way off the standard window. What value here do I definitely have to make way, way higher? Yep. Uh, the y. Yeah, the y max. I've got a y intercept of two hundred thousand, and it's only going up from there. So, let's set our y max. I'll do zoom six just to show you what you'd see, which is just that. All right, so you can see the y equals 4x, but you can't see the other one. So let's set our y max at 200,000. Now y is basically, bless you, Thank you. that right there. Does negative cost make sense? No. How about negative revenue? No. Cost is positive. You have to pay the bill, you pay, the, you pay whatever the bill is. Revenue is positive. Those are both positive numbers. So that doesn't make sense. Do you have tissues? Um, I, get, I get that up there. That's all I get, though. Paper towel. Um, now, x is the number of shirts that we make. Does it make sense to have a negative number of shirts? No. Now, maximum number of shirts. Uh, there is no maximum. Let's just try making, uh, let's try like 3,000 shirts. Let's just hit graph and see what happens. All right, um, so I can see one of those lines. Did I not adjust? Let's see, y max. Okay, so I set my y max to 200,000, but remember, it's only going up from there with a positive slope. So I should probably set it maybe to like 300,000. Okay, now I can see the other line. I can see the red line. What do you think is going to happen eventually? I can't see it on the screen yet. But, yep. Um, both lines going across. They're going to cross somewhere. At some point, the revenue is going to catch up to the cost because you're selling each shirt for more than it costs to make it. So they're going to start making money eventually. So let's try 3,000 shirts is definitely not enough. Let's try 30,000 shirts. No. We're getting there. Okay, but now you can start to see the revenue is, is catching up. Let's try maybe 100,000 shirts. I think, I think that'll do it. So there's my cost. There's my, no, okay. So X is good, but I gotta set Y a little bit higher, and then I think I'll be able to see it. So let's try 350,000. There's my cost, there's my revenue, good. So as far as finding a complete graph, which is what they wanted us to do, um, we've done it. What you'd want to write down is, uh, that was zero. Write down your x min and max, your y min and max. You might have used 400,000, that would probably be fine. Okay. So there might be more than one answer for that. Any um, questions on the graph? All right, so as Chris said, we're, what's important here is where they cross. And where they cross is called the break-even point. It's the point at which the cost and the revenue are the same. Before that point, you're losing money. After that point, you're making money. So Chris already answered this question that I was going to ask. If you make a graph, where is the break-even point? It's where they intersect. Okay, so we're going to be finding um, an intersection. Okay, but that's important. Cost, revenue, same. Okay, just remember that. Cost equals revenue. So if the break-even point is where cost and revenue are equal, we can set up an equation and we can solve it. Or we can use the graphing calculator and solve it. Um, we'll do both. 
For this problem, because the equation is pretty simple, I can probably solve it faster with algebra than I can on the other. Okay. So let's find the number of shirts that the company has to sell um, in order to break even. And I didn't write, write it down, but this is uh, for a graph of cost and revenue. Where is this point? It's the intersection. It's the intersection. All right, so break even. Scroll back up. Break even point, cost equals revenue. So we can basically say, cost, that was our expression for cost, and there's our expression for revenue. Now just substitute in what we actually wrote. Um, can someone remind me what was the formula we had on the other page for cost? Zach? 1.5x plus 2. Yep. Okay, and what about revenue? What was our revenue? Emily? 4x. 4x. So now just solve it. Um, if you subtract the 1.5 to the other side, you're going to get this. 4 minus 1.5 and is 2.5. And, and divide by 2.5. And and you can double check me, but if you take 200,000 divided by 2.5, that is 80,000 shirts, I believe. 80,000 shirts. Anyone double checked it? Is that what it came out to? Yep. Okay. So that's how many shirts they have to sell to break even. And we solved it pretty quick algebraically. Now, let's do it graphically. Okay, I think graphically takes longer because first thing you got to do is you got to type the equations in and then you got to get your window. And it took us a little while to get the window. We had to keep playing with the, with the mins and maxes till we could see it. So I mean, that, that alone took like maybe 30, 40 seconds. Right. Now I gotta do second, calc, intersect, pick a point on the blue, the red, and a guess. All right, and let's compare that to what we just got. So doing it graphically, there you go. X equals 80,000, just like we got before. And that's shirts. Now, if this company makes 80,000 shirts, what would their cost be to make 80,000 shirts? What would it be exactly? Yeah? 320,000. Yep, it would be 320,000. It's right there. That would be their cost. What would be their revenue if they made 80,000 shirts? Yeah? Zero. This is at the break even. Oh, oh, no, I'm thinking. Not their profit. Their profit would be zero. So, Sam, what does that mean their revenue would be? So we said to make 80,000 shirts, the cost is 320,000. So what's the revenue? 320,000. This is the coordinates of the break-even point. X is shirts, Y is either cost or revenue. Depends which graph you're looking at. But at the break-even point, the cost equals the revenue. So $320,000 is exactly what it would cost to make 80,000 shirts, and they would make 320,000 in revenue. After 80,000 shirts, now they start making money. Okay. Any um, questions on that? So that's all that was really in that section, 2.2 part two. That was the end of it. So the homework from that section is going to be, I think it's like four questions, and it's doing what we just did. It's a break-even point. 
So we'll spend most of the time now on um, section 2.3. <coughs> So I'm going to go over a few really basic things from Algebra 1. If, if you feel you already know it, you may not have to write it down. Um, but we're definitely going to go through quadratic formula. So if you don't know that, I would, I would write that down. Okay. So in section 2.3, we're going to be solving basic um, linear equations. And then we'll get into a little bit a little bit harder quadratic equations. So, remember what, what an equation is. This is not an equation. That's an expression. To make it an equation, you got to have an equal sign. There you go. Now that's an equation. So an equation is a statement that has an equal sign between two things. Okay, usually we call those two things expressions. Now, in this equation, um, Eric, what's my variable? Um, X. If your equation uses X as a variable, then we just say that that's an equation in X. If your equation used M as a variable, you could say that it's an equation in M. Well, it's just, that's what you call it when you use x as, as your variable. Um, so solving an equation right, means to find the values of x that make it true. When we're solving linear equations, anyone remember how many answers you, you usually get? The most common thing that happens. Mr. Babb? There are no answers. No answers. Could that happen? What do you think? Could we get an equation that has no answer? Yeah. yeah. If you're like, finding the square root of a negative. OK, so if you had a problem uh, that had a square root of a negative, we're going to start by looking at linear equations, so we're not going to have any square roots yet. But definitely, if you had square root of a negative and you're only talking about real, yeah. Um, what else can happen besides no solution? Yeah. Anyone else? About oh, Zach? Can you save us? What else can happen besides no solutions? Yeah, how many? You'll never get two answers to a linear equation, exactly two. Yep. You can get one, or you could have infinite. Right? You either get zero, one, or infinite. That's all that can happen. So when we're solving linear ones, a lot of times it's going to come out to one solution. Okay, that's the most common. If you have an equation that has an infinite amount of solutions, Anybody remember what that's called? Yeah. So the answer would be all real numbers, and the type of an equation begins with an I. I'm sorry. Yeah. A what? Not, not imaginary. Uh, what is this? Identity. identity, yes. An identity. So an identity is an equation that is true for all values of the variable. That equation right there is an example of an identity. So, can anybody tell me why? Somebody in Algebra 1 might not recognize it right away, but if you look at that, you basically have the same thing on each side. 
you have 3x plus 2 equals 3x plus 2. Whenever that happens, that's an identity, right? Versus the other kind of situation I was talking about is one where you might have one solution. That's called a conditional equation. In that equation, it's not true for every value of x. It's not an identity. But it is true if you pick the right value for x. It is true if you pick the right value. So in that case, if you let x equal 5, it would be true. Any question on the difference between a conditional equation and an identity? Okay, I didn't show you one that's a no solution, but if I made up something like that, um, and let's do like, If you were to solve, as long as I set this up right, if you were to try to solve this one, I don't think it's going to have a solution. When you distribute, you get 2x plus 6 on the left, you get 6x plus 3 minus 4x, and what's 6x minus 4x? 2x. So you get 2x plus 6 equals 2x plus 3. That's impossible. You can't double a number and add 6 and double a number and add three and ever have it come out to be the same. There is no number that would ever work. And if you're still not sure in Algebra 1, what I usually say is, okay, put all your variables on the same side. Let's move the 2x over to the other side. That's gone, that's gone. That's a false statement, six equals three. Okay. Versus an identity is a true statement. You get the same thing on each side. Okay. So this is an example of a no solution. A one solution, all real numbers are the solution. Okay? All right. So if you want to check, and I don't have people in pre-calculus check like I do in like Algebra 1, but when they first learn it, I teach them, okay, to check your answer, plug it back in, and see if you get a true equation. If you do, then you found the right answer. If you don't, then you either found the wrong answer, or you checked it. Okay. So this would be an equation that would be a little hard to, to solve by hand. Um, how come? What's, what's hard about that equation? Yeah. Yeah, it's cubed, right? Cubes are kind of hard to work with. If it's the highest exponent of 2, that's OK. Because 2, we can either factor, we can use quadratic formula. But when it's cubed, 3 are up. Um, unless we've got a special technique or something that's going to work here, we're, we're kind of stuck. Now, this is one where something special would happen. So by the end of chapter 4, you will be able to solve that by hand. But all I want you to do is I'm telling you that negative 2 is a solution. I want to just double check. All right. So, Chris, how would I check that negative two is a solution? You plug in. Do what? Plug. How about um? Kara, how would I how would I check a negative two as a solution? Plug negative two times. Yep. And when I do that, what am I hoping to get on the left? Zero. Right. I'm hoping to get whatever number is on the right, which in this case is zero. Okay. Let's plug it in and check. All right. So we've got negative two cubed minus negative two plus six. I'm just going to put a question mark there because that's what I'm trying to figure out. Does that equal zero? Um, so, Jacob, what's negative 2 cubed? Negative 8. Yep, negative 8. 
minus minus 2. Just be careful with that. It's going to become a plus 2. Plus 6 equals 0. Um, is that negative 8 plus 2? Negative 6. Negative 6. Now we can see, yeah, we're good. Negative 6 plus 6 is 0, which means that negative 2 is a solution. Later on, we're going to learn that if you have an exponent of 3, you could have up to 3 answers. Some of them could be real, some of them could be imaginary. We're not, we're not there yet. But at least you know this is a solution. Now, knowing that that's a solution, by the end of chapter 4, you could now find the other two. Because there are a total of three. But we'll learn that later on. Any question on how we check that that was a solution? Okay. Uh, let's try uh, solving a linear equation. So that's what a linear equation looks like. Or at least you could rearrange a linear equation to look like that. Like if you had something like this. You might say, well, that doesn't look exactly like what you said. You said it should be equal to 0. Well, I could subtract 12 from each side and then just make it equal to 0. So I could say 2x minus 4 equals 0. Right. But any equation that can be rearranged to look like that is what we call a linear equation. Now, this is saying, uh, what does this say about a and b? All that stuff off to the right. Yeah, Jerry? They are um, careful. R stands for over real numbers. Real numbers. Oh. So this says A and B are real numbers, except what? Zero. Except A can't be zero. Why not? What would happen if, if A was zero in that equation? Emily? And it wouldn't equal zero later So what would you what would you have if A was zero? Right, you'd have 0x, and what's 0 times is it x? Zero. 0. So what you've done is you just wiped that part out. Now you just have b equals 0. That's, that's not a linear equation in x. You just wipe the x out completely. Right. So a can be anything except 0. Okay. So in algebra 1, this would be like maybe a fourth or fifth well, it depends what level of Algebra 1, but in like a CP2 class, this would be like a fourth or fifth lesson. Right? But let's just, we'll jump right into it and see if we can um, solve for x. Now remember, one of three things will happen. No solution, one solution, or two solutions. Uh, no, I'm sorry, one, zero, or infinite. Infinite. All right, so Elias, um, what's the first thing that I uh, that I have to do here? Can you describe what you have to do, even if you don't remember like the name of the property? Multiply what's outside of the parentheses by what's inside. Yes. So you're gonna multiply what's on the outside to what's on the inside. Distribute. Distributive. Yep. Yeah, I was like pointing out on that. Remember when you distribute. You always distribute the sign that goes with that number to the left. So here you're distributing a 2. Here you're distributing a plus 3. Okay. You might say, well, what does it matter if you distribute plus 3 or just a 3? Well, in this case, it doesn't. But if that was a minus, you would distribute that minus with the 3. So always grab the sign that goes to the left of the number when you distribute. Okay, and... Uh, Okay, what do I get when I distribute in the um, first set of parentheses? Oh, I'm sorry, K, uh, not K, love her. But I'll, I'll get it with her eventually. Yeah. 4x minus 6. Yeah, 4x minus 6. Um, and, all right, we'll go with, uh, with Caleb. What do we get when you distribute out the, um, the 3? Uh, 3x plus 3. Plus 3x plus 3. And the right-hand side stays the same. Okay, um, Sam, what would I do now? Combine the 4x minus 6 and the 3x plus 3. Yep, 
we got a 4x and a positive 3x. We've got a negative 6 and a positive 3. Can you tell me what you get when you combine all that? Well, as much as you can combine. 7x minus 3. Yep. So 7x, you can combine the x's. And now combine the numbers. Uh, Right-hand side still stays the same. Up until that step, you really didn't have any choices. Now you have a choice. So what, what's my choice now at this step? I think one way to do this is easier than the other way. Yep. Put all the variables on the left. Right. So you could choose to put the variables on the left or on the right. Is there any reason why you chose the left? It just comes out nicer. It's x equals. I, I've always done it that way. Okay. So it's going to have the x on the left. That's usually nice. Any? Can anyone think of another reason? Yep. X is a negative. Right. You're going to keep the x positive. So if you minus 5x, minus 5x, what's plus 3 at the same time? 5x minus 5x, gone. Minus 3 plus 3, gone. Uh, Brianna, what's 7x minus 5x? 2x. 2x. And Eric, um, on the right-hand side? Plus, uh, yeah, plus 5. Plus 5. And Zach, what's my last step? Uh, divide by 2. Divide by 2. And you're done. If they ask for a decimal, you could just type it in. If not, I would just leave it. So this was the case where we had a conditional equation. What's on the left can equal what's on the right, but only if you let x equal 2.5. Okay. Any questions on that? Let's look at um, an absolute value equation. So we're still in the realm of linear equations. We haven't gone yet to quadratics. Okay. Basically, what's going to happen with absolute value is you're going to solve two equations at the same time, or one right after the other. Okay? But the idea with an absolute value equation is you have to split it apart into two. Now, if any of the directions seem confusing or the step is unclear, let me know. Because this is one thing that um, people, they just had trouble with on the test. So, we're going to split it into two. But the first thing we have to do is make sure that the absolute value expression is by itself. Here's an example of an equation where the absolute value is by itself on one side. Absolute value of 3x plus 4 equals 2. I'm not going to solve that problem. I'm just showing you an example. Okay. Here's an example of an absolute value that's not by itself. Um, now you've got something else on the left-hand side that you need to move to the right first. Okay. So in order to isolate that absolute value, what would you have to do on both sides of this problem? Is that? You'd have to add 6. Yep. So if you've got anything outside the bars, get rid of that first. Then we can split it into two problems. When you split it into two, the first problem you write down, basically just erase the bars. Just copy the exact same problem but get rid of the bars. Right, so if you had something like, let's just do this, 2x equals 6, absolute value. This would be your first problem. 2x equals 6. And now I'll show you how to do the second one. Actually, you tell me. What's inside these bars, 2x? could come out to 6, and it would be fine. What else could this come out to, and it would still be fine, besides 6? Yeah. Negative 6. Or it could come out to negative 6. Whether 2x equals 6 or 2x equals negative 6, it's going to be an answer to this problem. So what did we just do there? The second equation that um, Jared just gave me, 
It's just like the original problem, without the bars again, but change the sign of the number on the other side. That's what negate means. Make the number on the other side its opposite. So the number was a 6. He made it a negative 6. Okay, so we'll try solving um, an absolute value. And um, then we'll do the last thing we're going to do with um, linear equations, which is a mixture. So, step one says isolate the absolute value. Um, Nikara, is the absolute value by itself there? Yeah. Yes. There's nothing else on the left hand side outside the bars. If I did this, now there's something else outside. I would have to divide each side by six. Okay? So now absolute value is by itself. This one is ready to split into two problems. Uh, Chris, can you give me one of the two problems? So we still need more here. We got to make this into an. We got to have two equations. We have two equations. Not sure, Jared. Two uh, x plus three equals five on the left. First equation is the same as the original problem, just without the bars. That's all you do. Same as the original, no bars. 2x plus 3 equals 5. And Sam, what about, yep, yeah, did you want to try the second one? So it would be 2x plus 3 equals minus 5? Yes. And now when you solve it, it's exactly the same steps to solve each equation. Um, how about, uh, Caleb, what's going to be my first step in each equation? You have to get x by itself. So, mm -hmm. so it'd be first one would be minus three. Yep. Minus three, minus three. Same thing here. Minus three, minus three. Okay. Um, Elias, when I minus three from each side um, on the left, what am I what do I end up with? Two x equals. Yep. And when I do it on the right? Now you don't have to do both at the same time. You can you can do one and then do the other. I just that's how I tend to do it. Um, and Emily, what's going to be my um, last step? Yep. X equals one, and X equals negative four. And I'm not going to check both of them, but let's just check one of them. If you plug in one, two times one is two. Two plus three is five. Absolute value of 5 is 5. Yep. And you could check the other one if you wanted. But that's how you solve an absolute value um, equation. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. So last thing we'll do with linear problems, um, and then we're going to finish up with quadratics, is a mixture problem. So the idea of a mixture problem is you're going to have maybe a 10% solution and a 20% solution. Okay, you've got two solutions. You're going to mix them together. And the problem will tell you what they want you to make. Maybe they want you to make a 11.5% solution. So you've got to mix a certain amount of one and a certain amount of the other. And they say, okay, 11.5% and they want you to have 100 gallons. So how much of each do you have to mix to do that? 
So that's basically what we're, we're going to do. So this requires two equations. Okay. The first equation is just the total amount. Like, let's say I set up, uh, I forget what I said exactly, I think it was 100 gallons. You take how much you use from the first solution, how much from the second, add them together, and it equals the total. Now, with that equation, that's not enough information. Because if you said, okay, mix two things together to get 100, there's a lot of answers. I could do 10 and 90, I could do 40 and 60, I could do 1 and 99. But the thing is, they're going to tell us what they want the solution percent to be. So maybe they want it to be exactly a 13% solution of rubbing alcohol or whatever it is. That's where the second equation comes in. So the second equation is the concentration of your first solution times the amount plus the concentration of your second solution times an amount equals the final, let's call this final concentration times the total. Okay, so in, in an actual problem, they're going to give you the concentrations. So they'll give you those three things, and they'll give you the total. They'll give you four things. You're going to solve for amount one and amount two. One thing you've got to remember about the concentrations, um, they're all decimals. They have to be decimals. So if they say 12%, you're plugging in 0.12. So concentrations have to be decimals. Right. So to set up a mixture problem, that's all you need. So let's... Um, Let's uh, try one, see what happens. Now, they may or may not tell you what the solution is. That doesn't matter. They just say it's a 10% solution, and you're like, well, 10% solution of what? Well, who cares? 10% solution of rubbing alcohol, 10% solution of acid. I mean, it could be whatever it is. Okay. So in this problem, we have two solutions, a 10% and a 25%. Now, would it be possible to mix these two together and somehow get a 50% solution? No, right? You can't make a stronger solution from two that are already more diluted. You can't, that's not possible, right? You can mix these two together and get something in between. That's all you can do. So in the end, they want you to mix these two solutions together to get 15 liters of a 12% solution. So without even doing any math, does anyone think they can tell me which one, solution A or solution B, are you going to use more of? Yeah? A. Why? Because the number is closer to A. Yeah. The final solution it's only a little bit above A. So you're just going to pour a little bit of B in to just bring the concentration up to 12%. Okay. So let's start with our first equation, the, the simpler one. Amount 1 plus amount 2 equals the total amount. Okay. They've already picked the variables for us, A and B. So how much, or how, how are we representing the amount of the 10% solution? Uh, oh, the amount? The amount, yep. And again, you do not have a trace of variable because they've already picked it. A. A. So you're going to use A liters. That's the 10%. How much of the 25% are we going to use? Chris? Oh. That? B. B. So when we add A and B together, we want to have a total amount 
of 15 meters. So there's your first equation. That by itself is not enough. I mean, A could be 1, B could be 14. A could be 10, B could be 5. We don't know. What's going to give us enough information is now setting up the second one. Concentration times amount, concentration times amount. Okay. So start with the 10%. How do you write the concentration? And remember what I said about the concentration. Yeah. 0.10. 0.10, yeah, or just 0.1 is fine. Concentration times... How much of that solution are we using? This is the 10%. Yep. Yeah. A. We don't know. Plus, what's the concentration of solution B? Chris? 0.25. 0.25. And how much of, solu of the 0.25 solution are we using? B. B equals, now, the final concentration times the total. What's the final concentration we want to end up with? Emily? 0.12. And what's the total? 15. 15. So the right hand side, we can actually do that up. So let's, um, let's do that. 0.1a plus 0.25b. Um, and when you multiply 0.12 times 15, um, what do you get, Zach? 1.8. 1. 1. 1. Perfect. Right. Now, we haven't used this equation yet. We're going to rearrange that equation for either A or B and plug it into this equation right here. Does anybody remember what that's called? Yeah? Substitution. Substitution. Yeah. So, um, Jared, what? letter do you want to get by itself in this equation? A. A. So can you tell me, just kind of off to the side, what does A equal? The, like the, when we get it by itself? Yeah, in that top equation. 15 minus B. Yep. 15 minus B. Alright, so we're going to take 15 minus B, and we're going to fill that in right there. Yeah, let's see what we get. Point 0.1, and now fill in for A. 15 minus B. Plus 0.25B equals 1.8. Now, look at that equation. How many different letters do we have now? One. Just one. One letter. Now it's a linear equation we can solve. So distribute the point, point 0.1. Um, 0.1 times 15 is going to give you 1.5 minus 0.1b plus 0.25b. Okay, on the left we've got some like terms. What's negative 0.1 plus 0.25? How much? 24.9. Um. Not quite. Uh, 0.15. 0.15, yeah. Yeah, you're just off a little bit. I kind of know what you did there. So 0.15b. Okay, um, Eric, what would be my, uh, my next step? Uh, you'd want to get uh, subtract 1.5, you said? Yep. And 1.8 minus 1.5 gives me... 0.3. 3. Last step. Actually, these numbers are working out nice. What's 0.3 divided by 0.15? Well, I think of 30 divided by 15. 2. 2. So, I need 2 liters of solution A. Uh, I'm sorry, 2 liters of solution B. How many liters of solution A? Yep. 13, because we had a total of 15. And that's how you do a mixture problem. There'll be one just like that on the test, and that's how you do it every time. Most of the time, they make the numbers work out nice. Doesn't always have to happen, but I will generally try to make that happen. Okay. Any um, question on that? 
So the 13 comes from the fact that we know we had a total of 15, and we know one of them was 2. So then to total 15, it would have to be 13. Yep. Okay, so last thing we'll um, finish up with is solving quadratics. So quadratic equations, one step up from linear. Okay. In a quadratic, what's your, um, what's your highest exponent? Mm -hmm. Two. Two. So quadratics usually look like ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Or at least they can be rearranged to look like that. Okay. Now, same thing I said with linear. a, b, and c can be real numbers, except a can't be zero. And I asked this question before. Why can't a be 0? What would happen if it was? Zach? It would be a linear equation. Right. If you make a 0, you just wiped that out. Now you've got bx plus c. Well, that's what we had before. That's linear. b and c could be 0. Like you could have something simple like this. That's a quadratic where b and c are 0, but a can't be 0. What's um, one way you can solve a quadratic? And I'm thinking of a way that if the numbers are very nice, this method works. It only works when the numbers are nice. Factor. Yep, you can factor. So remember, when you factor, it's when you put two sets of parentheses. So let's, um, let's try one that I will tell you it, it does factor. Always start with two sets of parentheses. And I didn't actually, this one's already done for you, but you always want to make sure it's equal to what? Zero. If you had this as a problem, is what I just wrote there and what I have there the same problem? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same problem. It's the same answer. Whatever you find for x here is the same answer here but you don't want it equal to 3. You want, the th you want it always equal to 0. Okay. All right, so the first two terms have to multiply together to give me 2x squared. Uh, someone tell me two things I can multiply to get 2x squared. Yeah? 2x and 1x. 2x and 1x. You don't have any choices there. Okay. It's not like if this first term was a 12x squared, now you've got all kinds of choices. You could try 6x and 2x, 4x and 3x, 12x and 1x. You've got all kinds of options. 2 is a prime number. Okay. Same with 3. There's not a lot of options. Now there's four cases. Basically, when you're factoring it, you've got to figure out your signs. Okay. You can make a chart like you do in Algebra 1 if you want, or if you guys need that, I can show you the chart. But Let's see if we remember it. Positive constant, I mean positive linear term, negative constant. Anybody tell me what my signs are going to be down here? Yeah? Uh, 2x minus 5 and x plus 2. All right, let's try a minus and a plus. Let's start with that. And it does matter which one goes where. We might have to switch those. And now we need two numbers that multiply to give me 3. 3 is prime. So there's only one way to do it. Yep. 2x minus 1 and x plus 3. So 1, 3. Let's check it. 2x times x is 2x squared. Yep. 2x times 3. I'm just going to do it off to the side. Negative 1 times x. 6x minus 1x. Perfect. 5x. And negative 1 times 3 is negative 3. Great. So now we factored it. Perfect. Now, look at kind of the... The big picture. Pretend like you can't even see what's in those boxes. In fact, you don't have to pretend. I'll go like this. You have something times something equals zero. What's the only way you can multiply something times something and get zero? Yeah? One of those equals zero. Right. One of them, or both of them, have to be zero. 
So either this equals zero, which means x equals 0.5, or this equals zero, which means x equals negative three. Any, um, any question on that? So once you factor it, it really turns into solving two linear equations, kind of like when you do absolute value, but I think factoring is a little harder than absolute value equations. Now, factoring is great if the numbers are, are nice and simple. What's another method you can use if you can't factor it? Actually, two or three more methods. You could graph. Okay, you could always do a graph. But besides that, I'm thinking just algebra. Quadratic equation. Yep, you can use the quadratic formula. So just a reminder of what the quadratic formula is. Okay, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. All kinds of problems with this in the test last week. All, all kinds of issues. Some people forgot the first one was supposed to be negative. Um, some people forgot that it was 2a in the bottom. They put just a. I mean, uh -oh. all kinds of stuff went wrong. So, I don't know, there's the formula. That's, that's what you gotta use. This part under the square root is called the discriminant. So remember, that is a quick way to tell how many answers your problem will have. Right? If you quickly check b squared minus 4ac, it either comes out negative, positive, or zero. And depending on which one of those conditions it comes out at, it'll tell you if you have um, no answer, two answers, or one answer. The last problem we did that factored was a two answer problem. Now, I said this earlier, but in order to use the quadratic formula, you have to get it equal to zero. That's, that's important because if you look, I'm just going to go back to the way I wrote this one. If you say, oh, A is 2, B is 5, C is 3. Now, that's not in the right format. C should really be negative 3. Always make sure you get it equal to zero. So we got that one. Okay, so we'll do uh, we'll do one problem that's just a just a solve. I'll give you the equation, and then we'll finish up with a um, word problem that ends up being a quadratic. Okay, so let's solve this one. All right, what's the um, first thing I should do here? Chris? Subtract one from both sides. Yep, subtract one from both sides. So we're going to make it look like this. So 2x squared plus 2x minus 1 equals 0. Now I look at it, highest exponent, then the number that just has an x, and then just the number without the letter. Right. So Jacob, what's um, what's a here? Uh, a would be uh, two. Yeah, which one? Uh, one. The, the so your choice would be the one in front of x squared or the x. Oh, x squared. Yeah. Uh, b would be two. Yep. C would be negative one. Yep. And now we're going to fill all that into the formula. Uh, so, Nikara, can you tell me, as I fill in A, B, and C into the formula using those numbers, what would I write? Negative 2 plus or minus 2 squared minus... One thing first. Negative 2 plus or minus... The square root. Yep, that square root in there. Okay. 2 squared... Minus 4 times 2 times negative 
divide or over it by two times two. Yep. And if you guys set it up just like that on the test and you do out the arithmetic, that's perfect. That's exactly how you set it up. Negative two plus or minus. What's four times two times negative one? Four times two times negative one. Positive Just four times two times negative one. Uh, negative eight. Negative Because I already have that negative written from that part. And now I have another negative. Oh. Okay. People mess up that sign a lot. Well, wouldn't it turn into a positive? Yep. So now we're just going to have negative 2 plus or minus square root of 12 over 4. Now, what's not simplified there? Square root of 12. Right, the square root of 12. How can you break up the number 12? Yeah? Uh, 2 and 6, 3 and 4. I would do 12. 3 and 4. Right? Break it up like this. The square root of 12 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 3. And now, what's the square root of 4? 2. So you just simplified it. Negative 2 plus or minus 2 root 3 over 4. And now look what happens. What can you cancel from all three spots? Or what can you reduce by? Zach? A 2. 2 goes into 2 once. 2 goes into 2 once. 2 goes into 4 twice. So we get negative 1 plus or minus root 3 over 2. Okay. If this was a multiple choice question on a test, this is what you would see for an answer. You would not see that listed because it's not done. If it was a short answer question and you stopped at the square root of 12, I, I'd give you some points because you got pretty far but you'd lose a couple points because you didn't finish simplifying the square root. Okay. Okay. I'm confused about how you got from the negative 2 plus or minus 2 to the next thing. It's kind of like if you had like 3 plus 12 divided by 6. And I said, before doing that arithmetic out, what could you reduce everything by? Three. So it's kind of like 3 divided by 3, 12 divided by 3, 6 divided by 3. And now you have an equivalent problem where the arithmetic is a little easier. So anytime you want to reduce in a, in a um, quadratic formula problem, you have to do it here, here, and here. If you had something like this, and you said, oh, I'm going to divide this by 2, I'm going to divide this by 2, and I'm just going to leave the bottom. You can't do that. You've got to do it in all three spots. Okay. Any uh, other questions on that? Yeah? So simplifying the square root would be like dividing the <clears throat> Simplifying the square root, um, that's just breaking it into two factors. And I usually do it so one of them is a perfect square. And then that's the one that you can simplify. Like square root of 20, you would split up into square root 4 times square root 5. So the square root of 20 would be 2 root 5. Okay? So simplifying square roots, probably something you did maybe last year in Algebra 2. You probably would have... Wait a minute, no. You, yeah, you would have had Algebra 2 last year. Um, but it comes up a lot in pre-calculus. Okay, so let's look at the um, last thing. So it's a word problem, but the picture, you kind of need a picture to, to help you out a little bit. So we're starting out with basically a rectangular piece of cardboard. And what we're going to do is cut out a square from each corner. So then we can fold the sides up on that dotted line, basically to make like a tray. Right? So there's no top on it. It's just got a side, a side, and then 
the other two sides. Now, the W and the L that I have here refer to the width and the length of the original piece of cardboard that you folded, which is different than the width, the width and the length of your tray. Because okay? once you fold the sides up, your tray is going to get a little shorter than the original piece. All right. So now they're going to tell us a couple facts that will help us to figure out W and L. First thing they, okay, now I'm just explaining what we're going to do. We're folding the cardboard up along the dotted lines. The length is twice the width. How could you write that down as a, as a formula? The length is twice the width. Yep. That is equal to two W. All right. So let's keep that in mind. Length is twice width. Now, these facts right here, the length is twice the width and the volume, these refer to the actual tray, or what did I call it? Um, a box. These refer to your box. I'm not necessarily saying that the length is twice the width of the original piece of cardboard that you folded. I'm talking about after you make it into a tray, the length of your tray will be twice as long as your width. And the volume of your tray is 2,040 cubic inches. Find the dimensions of the original piece of cardboard. Okay, so first thing we're going to need is to set up an equation. This entire equation is going to be centered around volume. What's the formula for the volume? The shape is basically a rectangular prism. It's basically like a, it's like this. This is the shape you're making without a top on it. Yep. Length times width times height. Yeah. Length times width times height. Now remember, this is the volume of your box. So let's look at the length of my box. The length of my box is from here to here. How much shorter is that red line than the original length of the piece of cardboard? Because I folded the sides up, so it got shorter. Yeah? 10. So the length of my box is L minus 10. That's my length. What is the width of my box? It's shorter than the original width because I folded the sides up. Jared? W minus 10. W minus 10. Now, what's the height of my box? How tall are the, the walls? Yep. Five. They're five. That's what you folded up. Okay. Now, the volume we know is 2,040. What's wrong on that right hand side that makes that kind of hard to figure out? Yeah. Two variables, not really, right? Length equals twice width. So anywhere you see an L, all you have to do is change the L to a 2W. Now, if you're a little bit clever, right, and you don't foil this out yet, does anybody see what you could factor out of 2W minus 10? Yep. Two. Watch what happens if you do that. You don't have to, but it'll make the numbers a little smaller. You have a two times this times this times this. Well, two times five you can multiply together. And what is um, two times five? Ten. 
And if you divide each side by 10, what basically happens is that. If you divide each side by 10, the 2 times 5 is gone. And 2,040 would become 204. And now you'd have something like this. Um, what's that? W squared minus 10 minus 5. And from here, you could get it equal to 0 and solve it using the quadratic formula. So from this step, use quadratic formula. And if we want, we can finish that up tomorrow, but that's, that's the hard part, just getting the equation. I think the wording is a little tricky in it, and if it was on a test, I'd probably make sure the wording was very clear. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be confusing. I just think the length and the width can be a little confusing. Okay, um, so homework um, on page 89, that's a break-even problem. And then on page 96, that's solving some uh, quadratic and linear problems. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that tomorrow. And um, we'll also look at section 2.4 tomorrow, which is on inequalities, like less than, greater than, stuff like that.